Hello, my name is Robert Dean Steele, and this is your prayer time for, uh, I guess it would be April the 10th. Now, I, I want to spend some time with you today because the simple fact is that uh, from time to time, we have to understand that we come under attack. In fact, I was reading today in Psalm 119, Ezra says this, the wicked or my enemies are planning to attack me or to trap me, but I will stand upon your word. So that's a wonderful promise given to us today, that we have divine protection and divine help in every situation that we find ourselves in today. So that's what we're going to concentrate today on our time and place of prayer. So, Father, we thank you today that even when the enemy comes in like a flood, you raise a standard against him. And, Lord, we are that standard. Lord, we need to recognize that we are the restraining and enlightening force that we find ourselves in the world today. The enemy would not be able, cannot take our world when we are standing against them. So, Lord, thank you for that today. And thank you, Lord, today in this time and place of prayer, we are going to have that victory and that breakthrough today. And we want to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today I want to remind you about the fact that God has given us all the tools that we need to be able to win over the enemy. Think about this for a moment. God has given us the helmet of salvation to protect our minds. He's given us the breastplate of righteousness to protect our heart. He has given us the belt of truth that we can produce and reproduce truth in every part of our lives. He has also given us, for example, he has given us that shield of faith that every accusation, temptation, and deception of the enemy would be utterly destroyed in the name of Jesus. Also as well, God has given us that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it, has the, it is our offensive and defensive weapon against the enemy. And also, when you look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Psalm 91, in Psalm 91, it gives us three wonderful things that we know can actually be a hedge of protection around us. It has to do with, um, with uh, knowing his name, being uh, being his habitation and having God's love on us today. So, Father, we thank you today for this wonderful opportunity. And we thank you that, Lord, in this moment, you are going to pour out your Spirit upon us and give us that victory and that breakthrough today. Lord, it is absolutely essential that we know that your hand of protection is now upon us. You're leading and guiding and directing every aspect of our lives. And we want today, Lord, to walk in your anointing and your power, your authority, your enablement, your wisdom, your clarity, and your boldness. Lord, we are very much aware that we are facing three different adversaries. One is, of course, the enemy himself, Satan, and all his agents and entity. And so, Lord, recognizing that today, we also recognize that, Lord, his agenda is to rob, kill, and destroy. And so we need to actively resist him by putting on the whole armor of God. And so, Lord, today we want to enact that very thought. So we're going to do it, Lord, this way. Number one, we're going to put on that uh, belt of truth. Lord, that's what Paul was looking at when he listed all of these in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, first of all, put on the belt of truth. That's what a Roman soldier would do. It would be the very first thing he would do, and it would protect his vital organs and the vital parts of his life. And we know that, Lord, it is only the truth that's going to set us free. It is only the truth that's going to keep us, Lord, in these 
changing times. I guess that would be the best way. There's ebb and flow in culture. Lord, I was just thinking about, and I was just reporting about the fact that, you know, in the early 2000s, we had what we call flip phones. And the flip phones of were only designed for texting and also for answering the phone. Well, then came the smartphone, and then all of a sudden, people were running into buildings and, you know, and, and scrolling and, and doing all of that. Well, now the new generation, Generation Z, is now demanding from the uh, retailers and also the providers for phones. They say, what we want is we want a flip phone. And the reason they want the flip phone is because they recognize that they're spending too much time on their phones and not getting enough done. And also as well, many schools are now banning phones. And so they say, well, what we can do then is get a flip phone and it, they'll spend less time on the phone scrolling and doing all this other stuff that you can do with the phone. And then just having the ability to talk and text because that's really what they want to do. They want to talk and text with their friends. They don't want to scroll and do all that. That's what's happening. It's, you know, we find this ebb and flow in society. We also see, for example, in the political realm, how that we've had this left-leaning um, society for the last few years, and now people are saying, wait a minute, we see something going off the other way. For example, both in Canada and United States, we find that uh, parental rights are beginning to uh, push back and saying, listen, we want control over our kids' education. We want to be able to tell our, you know, we want to know what our kids are dealing with. And uh, we're finding out that school boards are now having p parents getting actively involved. And actually, the parental rights are becoming a major pushback on the education system, which has been following uh, anti-God and anti-Christian uh, beliefs. And so we have this pushback going on. And that's beautiful. But Lord, we know that the enemy is still going to push his agenda. That's why we need truth. Secondly, Lord, we need to walk today in that breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness means, of course, being right with God and right with man. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, which we just went through Easter with, what we find is this, Lord, is that because he did that, there's a wonderful song that says, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Jesus did that. He paid a debt that he didn't owe. He paid our debt. We owed it. It was our sin that put him to the cross. I know that many historians have said, well, it was the Roman Empire and the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people. And that is true. But it was actually all of our sins that made that happen. And Jesus, when he hung on the cross and said, it is finished, the power of death, hell, and the grave were broken. The power of the world, the flesh, and the devil were broken over our lives. But Lord, we need that righteousness today. And we need to have it with you, and we need to walk it in our world today. Then we put on that belt, or I should say the boots of peace. Now, Lord, I love this. The reason I love this is because of the fact that, Lord, you give us peace that the world can't give, and the world can't take it away. That's just, just a wonderful thing to know, Lord. And also in regards to that, then, Lord, as we walk in that peace and have that absence of personal conflict and warfare in our own lives, then there's something inside of us. Like when we love the Lord with all our hearts and we're healed, what we do is we want to share that with others. And so we do. And that means that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You and I, <clears throat> excuse me, are peacemakers. We are the children of God. And we are sharing a message of peace. And the Bible tells us, and I love these next two applications. Number one, Joshua was told by the Lord that wherever he goes, that's his territory. Now, 
take that to yourself and say, okay, wherever I go today, whether I'm walking through my neighborhood, whether I'm in a store, whether I am, you know, visiting a friend, going to the doctor's office, I am a peacemaker. I am bringing the peace of God where I am. And as long as I am there, I am God's representative. That means that my conduct, my speech, my attitude, my motives, the way that I, you know, live before these people, you know, taking that little extra mile, as you might say, that demonstrates that God is, of course, touching people's lives. Our act of kindness could actually change someone's day or even someone's life. I was thinking of the story uh, written by uh, Dante, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Dumas, the, the writer of The Three Musketeers. Uh, he also wrote a story called Les Miserables. And uh, in that story, what happened was this, that there was a, a, a fella who broke into the home of a priest. And uh, he um, basically took a couple of candlesticks and he was caught by the local gendarmes and brought back to the home. And uh, the, the gendarmes were going to take him off to prison. And uh, the, they asked the priest, did this man steal these candlesticks? The priest said, no. And uh, they said, okay. He says, I gave them to him. And uh, so then the gendarmes left. And the man said to him, he said, why did you do that? He says, well, basically, he says, I want you to use these candlesticks to enhance not only your life, but the lives of others. That left an incredible impression on that man. And that man went into, you know, left Paris, and then he found himself in a small little community. And the community had a particular industry. And uh, basically, they were going to go under. So he used the candlesticks to uh, buy the industry and then as it turned out, he became a very prominent individual. He also helped a young lady and adopted her daughter. And the story, of course, is the story of the love affair between the daughter and the young man and how that this man reformed his life and changed everybody that came around him because of one act of kindness. That's why we need to be Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So we need to go into our world and bring that peace that passes all understanding. Also as well, we put on that helmet of salvation. That helmet of salvation actually protects our mind from the uh, assault and the propaganda of this world. Remember, the world is constantly pouring out this pollution of pride, pleasure, and possession. They keep saying to you, listen, if you have, you know, this great self-esteem, you know, and you, you have this security and this significance, which happens to be the basic needs of humanity, you can find it in pride. You can find it in possession and uh, possessions and pleasure. And that is absolutely incorrect. I mean, all you have to do is read the book of Ecclesiastes. And here's a man named Solomon who had everything, everything, Lord, everything. And yet at the end of life, he said this, there's only one thing I know. And that is that all that this world has to offer is vanity. The one thing that you need to do is follow God and you'll find satisfaction in life. That is the essence of the book of Ecclesiastes. And when Solomon wrote this book, he was in a backslidden condition. But he recognized, even as a backslider, that the best life is the life of righteousness. So we can take that away. So what's basically happening is when we think on those things which are right and pure and holy and praiseworthy and virtuous and pure, etc., then we are going to be thinking, well, basically, we are walking in the Spirit is what we're doing. So we need to have that today. And then we take up that shield of faith. Now listen, faith is exactly what we need today. Not in ourselves, 
but in God. That's what we need today. We need to walk in the faith that we have in God. Now, what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It is uh, what God gives us. It's a gift from God. It's a communicated attribute of God that allows us to believe that something good is about to happen. That's what the old song says. And so what happens is when we receive this wonderful information about God, it rattles around in our minds and our faith says, you know what, I'm going to believe this and I'm going to put my future on this whole concept of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my sins. I am going to put everything on this. And no matter what anyone says to me, I'm not going to change my mind. We translate this information and we put it into our hearts and it becomes part of who we are. It becomes our DNA. That is why when the governments of 50 countries around the world put the pressure on Christians, they absolutely refuse to capitulate. They're not going to give in. They are going to serve the Lord. I remember the story of a Christian pastor who, during the realm of Idi Amin, they were coming to his village and uh, the government at that time, and there was a man who was standing there with an AK-47, and he said, you're a Christian, right? He said, yes. He says, what would you do right now if I, would you deny your faith if I took this gun and shot you? He says, absolutely not. And unfortunately, the man shot him, and he perished right then and there. But a revival came to that um, particular village because of his death, and that man who shot him later on became a Christian because he was so full of remorse. At the time, he was angry. At the time, he was, you know, basically following the, the uh, orders of Idi Amin. But later on, he was so filled with guilt and remorse over what he'd done. He sought salvation through Jesus Christ and became a well-known Christian leader. He said, when I pulled that trigger, he says, I had no idea what it was going to do to my life. And we need to recognize that the church is not going to be stopped because of some, you know, decree that comes down from some political or cultural or social leader. It won't stop us. We will. We are going to win in the end. But we need that shield of faith that allows us to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Whatever the enemy throws at us. I mean, we know his agenda, so we know he's going to use accusation, temptation, deception, other forms of attack, but we're not going to give in because we recognize that we have something greater than the enemy could ever offer. I mean, when you look at Jesus in the uh, temptation in the wilderness, Satan threw everything at him and Jesus did not bite because Jesus knew who he was and why he was here. And that's what we need to remember. We need to know who we belong to and why we are here. We belong to God. We're not in this, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. This is not as good as it gets for us. And we need to recognize that. Lord, help us to recognize that today. Help us to recognize that, Lord, you have a dream and you have a destiny for our lives. That only doing what you want to do is really going to give us full fulfillment in life. We got to recognize that. We also need to recognize about the fact that, Lord, we we are yours, and we're not going to give up what we have. Lord, we know that, for example, the, the, the great story, and it's the story of the prodigal. Here is this young man, spends everything he has on wine, women, and song. When the, runny, the, when the money runs out, he finds himself in a pig pen, and the pig slop looks really good. That day, he learned a very valuable lesson. And we need to remember that valuable lesson is that no matter what the enemy serves up, it is rubbish, it is pig slop, it will never satisfy the longing of your soul. Now, we have adequate proof 
in Hollywood about young people that were Christians and they got the very best in this world and later on they tragically lost their lives. It, 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 it just goes on and on. The enemy will rob you, he will kill you and destroy you. And you think that you got the very best in the world, sooner or later it will leave you hollow and it will leave you empty inside. And that is absolutely true. And so we need to remember, like when we walk in that shield of faith, it is going to quench every accusation of the enemy. And also as well, we have the word of God. And the word of God is our offensive and defensive weapon. When I started off, I gave you Psalm 119. Ezra writes there, he says, the enemy are laying plans to destroy me. But he says, I am going to stand on your word. The word of God is the thing that we need to stand on today. Now, you've often heard me talk about the fact that we need that daily time in uh, with the Lord, our daily devotions and daily prayer time. We need that. And the reason we need that is several fold. Number one, of course, we are setting time aside to meet with God. It is that time where we shut out the voices of the world and we say, okay, God, this is your time and I'm going to communicate with you in prayer and I'm going to read your word. It's going to feed my soul and I am going to be prepared for the day. That's why we have these daily times together because what I'm doing is I'm setting aside a time in my day to meet with the Lord and to show you the importance of personal um, growth. We grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in these personal prayer times. And yesterday, when I gathered together with my congregation and we spent that hour, 15 minutes, hour, 30 minutes together, what we were doing is we were saying, okay, this is sacred time. This is my time to be in the house of the Lord, to understand what God wants me to do through this week, and also to have the tools that I'm going to need to be able to lay aside those weights and sins that so easily beset us, whether it is in our personal prayer time or in our daily or weekly time with the Lord. Either way, we need that because we have an enemy who wants to lay traps on us, who wants to rob, kill, and destroy us, and we need the armor, and we need the weapons, and we need the power and the strength that comes from the Lord, and that comes when we spend time together. That's why we have our daily times together. And I'm hoping that these times together will help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need this, and I need this every day. Why? Because we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are pilgrims passing through. This is not as best as it is. Abraham, wonderful man of God, he was looking for a maker and a city whose maker and builder is God. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and I close with this. It says that the world was not worthy of the ones who walked by faith. When you walk by faith, you recognize that. And help us, Lord, to see that today. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I see by the clock on the wall that my time is gone. So I hope that something I've said has sparked uh, uh, some interest in you and also increased your faith. Now, if you like what you've been hearing, then I encourage you to press the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. My name is Robert Dean Steele. You have yourself a great and godly day.